If there are other intelligent races among the stars, will their geometry and algebra be the same as ours? If human history were to be rerun, would we inevitably come up with the same way of doing maths? How much of maths is part of the fabric of reality waiting to be discovered, and how much is of our invention and choice? Anthropologists assume the reason we've adopted a base 10 or decimal number system is that we have 10 fingers on which to count. In other words, the fact that 10 seems like a nice round number to us is just an accident of anatomy. If we'd evolved to have 8 fingers, we'd presumably count in blocks of 8 and have an octal system. The Yuki people of California and those who speak Parmean in Mexico do have octal systems because they count using the gaps between fingers rather than the fingers themselves. The Maya and other pre-Columbian cultures of Central America use base 20, perhaps because they counted using all their fingers and toes. Members of the Dozenol Society, formerly called the Duodecimal Society, argue that we should switch to base 12 because it would make calculations a lot easier. The reason for this is that 12 has 2, 3, 4 and 6 as factors, whereas 10 has only 2 and 5. It would also make telling the time easier, given that there are 12 hours on a clock. Although we use a base 10 number system for counting, a huge variety of units have been devised for measuring weight, distance, time, temperature and other quantities. Those who grew up in Britain in the 50s and 60s will remember having to do arithmetic with a monetary system in which there were not only halfpennies and until 1960 farthings or quarter pennies, but also 12 pennies to a shilling and 20 shillings to a pound. School maths exercises became a lot simpler when the UK went decimal in February 1971. Most countries have adopted not only a decimal currency, but also decimal units for measuring other quantities such as length, mass and temperature. Elsewhere, especially in the United States and Britain, older units such as pounds, gallons, feet and miles continue to be widely used, even though working with, say, 12 inches to the foot and 5,280 feet to the mile is more complicated than 100 centimetres to the metre and 1,000 metres to the kilometre. But of course, although there are different systems of units, the underlying maths, the rules of arithmetic that govern how we do calculations with these units, are the same in all cases. We may choose to measure distances in feet and inches or metres and centimetres, but if we divide the circumference of any circle by its diameter, we'll always get the same value. In base 10, this value is about 3.14159, which translates to 3.11037, etc. in base 8, 10.01021 in base 3, and so on. It's a fixed entity in the mathematical universe. So if there were intelligent beings on a planet on the other side of the galaxy, they'd know of this constant, which we call pi, and obtain the same value, although the symbols they use to represent it in any given number base would obviously be different. The fact that pi is an unchanging fixture of reality, something over which we have no control, didn't deter an attempt to redefine it in law. In 1897, amateur mathematician Edward Goodwin tried to convince the Indiana legislature to pass a bill to enact a new mathematical truth offered as a contribution to education. Goodwin was convinced, like many cranks before him, that he'd come up with a solution to a classic problem in geometry known as squaring the circle, and was keen that state lawmakers give official backing to his work. One of the effects of this would have been to make pi legally in this part of the American Midwest at least, equal to 3.2. The fact that in 1882 it had been proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that squaring the circle was impossible served as no deterrent to Goodwin. What's more, the Indiana House of Representatives, evidently short of anyone familiar with the Lindemann-Weierstrass theorem, 
was happy to pass the bill. Fortunately, it never became law, because by a stroke of good fortune, Professor Clarence Waldo, a mathematician at Purdue University, was in town just before the bill was to be voted on by the state senate. He was able to enlighten enough senators about the flaws in Goodwin's reasoning and the folly of legislating against mathematics that the bill was stopped dead in its tracks. Pi pops up in a different context at the end of Carl Sagan's novel Contact, but again in a way that focuses attention on the possibility of meddling with the value of this constant. Ellie Arroway, the researcher who discovers a signal coming from advanced aliens, is eventually told by them about a message that is encoded within the digits of Pi. Using a computer program, she finds the message, which starts after about a hundred million trillion places in base 11. Suddenly the random arrangement of digits that make up Pi gives way to a long string of ones and zeros. The length of the string is the product of two prime numbers. When Ellie uses these numbers to fix the size of a raster and then plots the points, a bright pixel for one and a dark one for zero, a very familiar shape appears, a circle. The constant that describes the ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter contains an encoded picture of a circle within its digits. The implication is that an incredibly advanced intelligence possibly present at the origin of the universe tinkered with the laws of nature so that it could pass on a message within the digits of pi to any beings that evolved to the stage where they could discover it. Fascinating though Sagan's suggestion is, it contains a flaw, namely that pi is a mathematical constant, not a physical one. It's true that the geometry of space-time could, in theory, be altered so that actually measuring the ratio of the circumference to the diameter of a circle to great precision would give different values. In fact, we live in a universe that is non-Euclidean, because both locally and over cosmic distances space-time is curved. But the value of pi isn't determined by measuring the circumference to diameter ratio of circles in the real universe. On the contrary, it's the unique value of that ratio for a circle in the space in which the geometry of Euclid applies. Perfectly mathematically flat. Pi also arises in other ways in maths that seemingly have nothing to do with circles, such as the sum of certain infinite sequences. Perhaps Sagan meant to imply that the superintelligence which implanted the message into Pi was so far beyond our ken that it could somehow manipulate a constant derived from mathematics itself. This would allow him to suggest that an intelligence might exist that has godlike powers, powers that transcend anything we can understand without equating it to an actual religious god. But even gods have to follow the rules of logic, and though it's easy enough to imagine other universes in which different sets of physical laws and constants apply, it's hard to see how there could be any tampering with the fundamental nature of mathematics. Having said that, there is possibly one exception. What if the universe in which we live is not what it seems? What if the universe is not a physical expanse of space and time and matter and energy, but instead is a simulation? This disturbing scenario has been much discussed in recent years by philosophers and even some scientists, Today's high-speed computers and sophisticated software can already generate simulated worlds within which we can interact as avatars and explore a realistic but entirely fictional landscape. As immersive technology evolves and devices such as neural interfaces become more effective and readily available, we'll be able to disappear for hours at a time into an entirely computer-generated alternative world which will seem as tangible and convincing as reality itself. But what if reality itself is a simulation and we ourselves and everything around us are mere artifacts in an alien computer of awesome speed and power? There would then be no limit to how much we and our fabricated universe could be manipulated from the outside. It would be quite possible to implant patterns or messages into irrational numbers such as pi, 
because the values of such numbers could be made part of the simulation and could be controlled externally at will. What we regard on the one hand as the laws of physics and on the other the immutable platonic realm of mathematics may both be arbitrary constructs of some fantastically powerful computer program. Assuming though that we're not unwitting digital denizens in some elaborate fantasy, that we're flesh and blood beings in an honest to goodness physical universe, how different could maths be? We'll explore this question further in part two.